We're looking at Psalms 29, verses 1 through 4 in the King James Version. It says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Today, this is the title of my message. The beauty and the power of holiness. And I want to preach this today just for the Lord. We're going to eavesdrop. I don't know of a more important message. I feel really unworthy and I feel really inadequate to preach it, to be honest with you. But I'm doing this for the Lord because I want to draw our attention to a holy God. You may be seated. Today, I want to examine the subject of God's holiness. Holiness could be the most powerful power in the whole world. When you see things like God is love, that's good. That's really good. That's comprehensive. God is love. It says that God is all wise. That's good too. He's omniscient. It says that God is omnipresent. That's good. Very good. We can say that God is long-suffering. That's good. But when you get on the subject of God is holy, that seems to me to trump everything else that's said about God. Holy. He's holy. Holiness is one of the great uh, themes of Scripture. There's no other book that reveals the true nature of holiness except the Bible. You won't find it in the Koran. You won't find it in the writings of Buddha. You won't find it anywhere in the halls of Congress and in the great libraries of the world. No other business, no other book, no other library, anything in the world reveals the true nature of holiness except the Bible. And the Bible says a lot about holiness, but we don't hear a lot about it. So I personally believe that holiness may be one of the most neglected topics ever from Scripture. There's been very little preaching on the subject down through the years, and I have to admit that I'm right in there guilty with the rest of them. There's been very little preaching on this subject of holiness, mainly because holiness has usually been presented as a list of rules that have to be observed with no scriptural basis offered at all about handing you this list of rules or presenting these rules. There's no scriptural basis for that. So God is holy, but he's not holy because he lives by a set of rules. God is holy not because he examines himself all the time against a set of rules that he has established of what it means to be holy. That's absurd. Following a set of rules will not and cannot make you holy, even if they're good rules. And I know years ago when I was young, in some of these Pentecostal fellowships, they had rules that was absurd. You know, women couldn't wear open-toed shoes. Men couldn't wear uh, tie, tie clips, and they couldn't wear uh, cufflinks, and um, you couldn't wear shorts, and you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. It's just a whole list of things that Pentecostals and holiness people didn't do. And uh, if you ever came into their church and you did that, they would put you under condemnation and make you feel guilty if you did it. So the one thing I want to say right up front about what holiness is not is it's not about rules. It's not rules about where you may go or what you may eat or how you dress. That's not holiness. Those things may have some credibility and they may have some 
um, recognition that we need to pay attention to in some areas because people can get overboard. But it's not going to make you more holy if you keep those things and your heart is not right. So look what the Apostle Paul said. Now, this is one of the most powerful scriptures that I've ever come across in the Bible. And whenever I saw this last night, I thought to myself, goodness gracious, how current is this scripture? It's an outstanding verse. It's found in Colossians, and the Apostle Paul was writing to his church at Colossae. And he said, you have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. Let's stop right there for a moment. He said, you've died with Christ. That's what your faith did. You died with Christ. He died in your stead. You died with him. So why do you keep the following, uh, keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, this is Paul now writing this, don't handle, don't taste, and don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. In other words, they're always changing. And it said these rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion pious self-denial, severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Isn't that interesting? Would you let me read that one more time? Let's look at it one more time. This is so to the point, this is Paul writing, and he was the writer to the Gentiles, but he also had a widespread knowledge of mosaic rules, regulations, he was a Pharisee. He knew all the writings of Moses, so he knew not only the Judeo, but he knew the Christian, the Gentile part of it, and he wrote most of your New Testament. So he's coming from the writings of Moses, and he's also coming from the revelation Jesus gave him. So here's what he said. You've died with Christ, and he sets you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, and don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Is that good or what? Come on, let me hear from you. Amen. It's true. It said they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. So Paul was saying this. He was saying the more you focus on what you must not do is the more temptation you have to fall into the very things that you don't want to fall into. Like, for example, I will not lose my temper. I will not lose my temper. And about 10 minutes later, you're having a big temper tantrum. Because you know why? You're focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on the don't. You need to focus on the do. Come on, now help me. Because we're focusing on the wrong thing. Frankly, people are turned off about the subject of holiness. And if you had a bunch of books for sale in a church library, people would pick up just about every book in that church library for sale except the book on holiness because nobody wants to read about holiness. It's put such a sour taste in people's mouth about holiness. And most Christians have finally concluded, I can't live like that. I can't live perfect. And that's exactly what holiness preaching does is it sets a bunch of rules before you that you can't keep. And what did the Apostle Paul say? They provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. So that's what preaching about holiness has meant to so many people down through the years that has been Pentecostal and raised in holiness type churches. That's exactly what's happened. So let me talk about the holiness of God for a moment. To understand the holiness of God, you've got to know God. You've got to know God. To understand holiness You've got to know him. You've got to spend time with him. When you find somebody that really knows God, you find someone who has a true concept of his holiness. Why? Because without God, there is no holiness. There is no holiness without him. 
So if you're going to know God, you will learn of his holiness. It says in Revelation chapter 15 and 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Look what it says. Thou only art holy. I want to just take my time, and I want to go through these, and I want us to digest them as I go. I want you to chew it and digest it as I go. And remember these things, because these things are really important, especially in the times that we're living in. It says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. All nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Everything about God is holy. Everything about him. If you ever come to understand the concept of God's holiness, you have come to know him. I want to tell you this about war. America, in years past, all pretty well believed much the same thing, even though there were different denominations. There were Episcopal, there were Presbyterians, there was United Methodist, there was Baptist, there was Pentecostal denominations many years ago, and there was just, you know, Church of the Brethren, you name it. There was churches all over the world, and pretty well everybody believed basically the same thing. They believed in heaven, they believed in hell, they believed in God, they believed in the holiness of God. And they all maybe had different lines of thinking about certain things, but basically America believed the same thing. But if you go back and you begin to study war in America, you begin to go back and really take apart society in America the way it used to be and the way it was after a, a major war, America's society changed after a war. You say, why? I don't know. I don't know if it was the bloodshed. I don't know if it was the animosity. I don't know if it was the pulling away of men from their families and their wives, and their wives had to go to work and help support the family. I don't know what it was about it, but you go all the way back to the Civil War, it tore brothers. It, put, it pitted brothers against brothers. It pitted the North against the South. It pitted good people against good people. It was such a bloodletting. It was such a pitting and such a release of spirits that when that war was over and the final shot was fired, America was different. You look at World War I, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. When that was over, millions of people were dead. It changed the nations of the world. Up until the Civil War, and up until the uh, World War I, almost everybody believed that God was holy. Almost everybody believed that he was a holy God and that he was sovereign and that God's will and God's ways was superior to everything else. But after those wars, everything began to change. And people no longer talked about the holiness of God anymore. After, you can trace it back, after World War I, people didn't talk about the holiness of God like they did before those two wars. Wars are hellish. They change nations. They change the people of those nations. Many times when a nation emerges from war, they have been radically changed by that war. Vietnam. I could talk about World War I, I could talk about World War II, but let me just jump to Vietnam real quick because I'm trying to make a point, but I don't want to get labored down in every war. I'm, let me just talk about Vietnam. It was a long war. Our young men were maimed. It was a different kind of a war. The Vietnamese was a formidable enemy, but it wasn't so much cannons fired from, uh, cannonballs fired from cannons. It wasn't so much ships as much as it was hand-to-hand -hand combat and dealing with an enemy that knew the territory well and we didn't know it. And many of our men came home, men and women came home with PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Many came home maimed, lost arms, legs, lost their minds, their peace. Suicide rate went up. 
It wearied this nation. It pierced the psyche of America. Authority, when, when that war was over, authority was then challenged. America changed because of the Vietnam War. Authority was challenged. Colleges and universities drastically changed. The type person that filled the professorships and the tenures at our universities changed. And they began to teach different things than had ever been taught in the universities of America. The music of America changed. The lyrics changed. The sexuality of America changed. Roe versus Wade was set in motion. And a tidal wave of death, millions of babies were killed over the next decades, over 50 million babies. America's heart was changed after the Vietnam War. And if you look at the Civil War and you want to find out where everything began to run off the rails, it was after the Civil War and after World War I. Until that, like I said, America had a pretty healthy concept of God, but now even the pulpits changed after those wars. The pulpits changed. Something about war, when they say that war is hell, war is hell. Not just on the people fighting it, but it releases a spirit that's going to change the psyche of a nation. It's going to change what that nation has believed. It's going to be shaken. It's going to be challenged. Politicians are going to be doubted. Presidents are going to be confronted. Legislators are going to be voted out of office because now all of a sudden people believe what they've never believed. People are aggressive when it comes to politics. And even now, in the houses of worship, holiness began to be reinterpreted in the houses of worship. After some of our most recent ethnic uprisings, we saw many things where people were patriotic. They used to be patriotic and they had respect for each other and their businesses, but something happened after this last ethnic uprising in the Northeast, especially and over in the far west, the northwest. Now, all of a sudden, after these type protests, now the national anthem is being protested. People would not stand for the national anthem. Disregard for people, disregard for their hard-earned businesses that they established and their possessions. Looting, burning, rioting, happened after these uprisings. War releases something. War releases something. Our nation went through further changes. A cultural contamination. Today's churches have gone through a revolution, a shocking revolution. Our culture in America has changed, but so has the culture of the churches. Today's churches have dropped or eliminated words like the blood. May I just go ahead and say right up front, and let me just get this said, we will never eliminate the term the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> never. They have dropped words like the anointing. Something has happened. Something has changed. Something has drastically changed. Even in churches and fellowships that were a holiness in their original beginnings, preachers don't say the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore. They don't give altar calls and they say, if you feel conviction this morning about the things that I've preached and the Holy Spirit's convicting you, we want you to come to the altar. That's never said behind churches anymore. Something has happened. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is not mentioned anymore. We don't want to sing about the blood. We don't want to preach about the blood. And you won't hear about the wounds of Christ, and you won't hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Would you like for us to pray for you today to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You never hear that. It's all been relegated off somewhere else. It's been a revolution. It's been a change. And couples today don't use the word husband and wife anymore. When you watch television, 
They won't say my wife or my husband. They say my partner. It's a revolutionary change in our country. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And now the politically correct community tells us you don't say boys and girls anymore because now they say that brings confusion to the gender. You can't say boys and girls anymore. We use the word now like transgender, LBGTQ. Simple words have replaced, have been replaced with those that besmirch the holiness of God. I believe I can trace where all this happened. It's coming now to a full shock. It's coming now to a full place, a full shock, where all these things that has been working now is out before our faces. It's everywhere on every hand. We see it. We're shocked by it. We've sort of tried to live with it and get along, and we just sort of, you know, see all this stuff going on, but yet at the same time, we're shocked by it. And I believe I can trace back to where it started. It was after the Civil War, the war between the states, and it was after World War I when they began to drop terms like the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God. Once you ever deviate from believing that God is holy, and once you ever deviate from believing that God is sovereign, and he is the most holy, and his holiness is above all, once you let that go, everything else is up for grabs. And it started a long time ago, but now, in our lifetime, we've managed to see it come to a full shock, and we're seeing this happen. And the only way that we're going to be spared as a nation where we are right now is for us to turn around and begin to return to the holiness of God. Amen. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. I want to talk about humanism just for a moment. Today, humanism has replaced God's holiness. It used to be God's holiness was the trump card. But today, humanism has replaced holiness. Let me give you a dictionary definition of humanism, and whenever I saw this, it, it sort of shocked me, to be honest. Humanism is the denial of any power or moral, moral value superior to that of humanity. Let me say that one more time. Humanism is a denial of any power or moral value superior to that of humanity. The rejection of religion in favor of a belief in the advancement of humanity by its own effort. Humanity, or humanism rather, is a deliberate denial and a rejection of God's power and God's authority. It is a anti-religious philosophy. So, this has resulted in a breakdown of law and order, defund the police. It has re 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 resulted in cold-blooded murder of law enforcement officials now almost daily. We saw just this last week in Houston, New York, and other places where cops are now being uh, attacked and assassinated in the streets of America, bloodshed almost every day, if not every day, every week. Criminals are now being treated more fairly than their victims. And why is this happening? We've strayed away from the awareness of God's holiness. So let me get back now to God's holiness. I wanted to say those things to sort of get our mind of where I'm trying to go. Let's get back to the subject of God's holiness. When you look at God's holiness, this is what I want us to begin to see. In Isaiah chapter 6, I want you to look at these scriptures with me. This is very powerful. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now let's stop right there for a moment. Who was Isaiah? He was a prophet. He was not a backslid prophet. He was a prophet set forth by God, called by God, effective. He was a very effective prophet. He was operating in his office as a prophet, a major prophet. But he said something happened, and he said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. 
and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered their face, two. With twain they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And one cried unto another. These, these seraphims were crying out to one another and shouting to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I began to do some investigation of that. And we see that from this passage, all of heaven is being continually reminded of the holiness of God to the point that the Bible said that the heavenly temple shook. Look at it. It said the post of the door moved at the voice of those angels that were crying, and the house was filled with smoke. The very place was shaken in heaven over the holiness of God. They were proclaiming the holiness of God, and it said the post of the door moved at the voice of these seraphs, and the house was filled with smoke. We're looking at the holiness of God. But I want you to notice what he said. Isaiah listened to them as they cried out to one another, Holy, holy, holy. And that's in the Old Testament. But the same thing happened in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. So we find God's holiness in Isaiah, Old Testament. Now we jump over and we find his holiness in the book of Revelation. And it said the four beasts, it didn't call them seraphs there. It called them four beasts there. Each of them had six wings. And they were full of eyes within. They rest not day and night. And they are crying constantly, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and ever and cast their crowns before his throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor, glory, and power, for you've created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. So let me ask you this question. What's the significance of these proclamations, holy holy, holy. When the seraphs looked at God on the throne, they were not just saying to the Lord, holy one time. They were saying to the triunity of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost, all three of you are holy. Right. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Ghost. Oh, let's say it together right now. Come on, help me. Holy, holy, holy. If I could say one thing this morning, and may God help my voice to echo, we must have a fresh visitation and a fresh revelation of the holiness of God. It is the only hope for America. Somebody give God praise. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. And holy is the Holy Ghost. Holiness, holiness is uniquely descriptive of God. Now, I want to show you something about this holiness thing now. I saw, and I believe the Lord showed me this. Whenever I looked at this with Isaiah, it's amazing the experience that he had. As soon as he cried out, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it said, The post of the door moved at the voice of him, this is verse 4, that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. But now, in verse 5, Isaiah picks up the narrative, and he said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Now, he was a full-fledged prophet, a major prophet. He was not a backslid prophet, a full-fledged prophet, prophesying on the earth, doing the will of God. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. It was a holy thing. These angels were crying, holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah saw that, the Bible says he made this statement, woe is me. I am undone. 
I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let me just stop right here and say this. When Isaiah came in contact with the holiness of God, probably for the first time in his life, that's the way it is a lot of times. God will call a man, God will call a woman, and they won't really have an encounter with God until after their call sometime later. That happens a lot of times. If God is going to make that man useful, if God is going to make that woman really useful in his kingdom, they're going to have to have a power encounter. You don't have to have a power encounter to be called, but if you're called, you better get prepared because somewhere down the line, God's going to give you a power encounter in your life. And look what he says. He said, oh my. He said, I am undone. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know what Isaiah was saying here? He's saying, when I saw the holiness of God, where my unholiness showed up was in my lips. When I saw the holiness of God, the first thing that smote him was, oh my God, my mouth, my lips. I am a man of unclean lips. Well, aren't you a prophet? Yes. Haven't you prophesied? Yes. Haven't you been affected for the kingdom? Yes. But when you come in contact with the holiness of God, it wasn't like God pulled out some kind of a, a rule book and said, Isaiah, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. You're not doing this. Here's the deal. When you're brought in the presence of the holy God, God don't have to bring nothing out. You just know I'm not where I ought to be with God. And I want to say this, that's where we are in American church right now. We don't need this, we don't need that, we don't need the other. We need to come in contact with the holy God. And it will show you exactly how you stack up. And here's what he said. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. It didn't show up in his sexuality. It didn't show up in his genitalia. It didn't show up in his mind. It showed up in his mouth. And he all of a sudden realized, oh my God, I'm a man of unclean lips. But here's the thing I love so much about this passage. This is what I love so much about this passage. Listen to me carefully. The Lord didn't tell him, Isaiah, you're going to have to get your act together, buddy. God never said nothing. Here's what he did. He just brought him in contact with his holiness. And as soon as Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips, boom, what happened? An angel comes flying over and says, I know just what you need. I know just what you need. The angel came flying over with a, with a, with a, with a coal off the altar and touched him on his lips. Come flying over and touched him on his lips. In other words, God never addressed Isaiah. It's just he brought him in contact with his holiness. Listen, many people think that God is wanting to give them all kind of negative messages. No, he just wants to bring you into his presence. And you'll take care of your own negative stuff. I, come on now, help me. I said, you'll take care of your own negative stuff when you're brought into the presence of a holy God. And that's why I say so many times in our churches, please hear me whenever I say this, I feel such a powerful anointing on me right now. I think sometimes we, we think that we've got to come in in a prayer meeting and we've got to pray, 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 and we've got to preach that prayer. We, woo, woo, we've got to pray like this, and yes, prayer is important. But I think sometimes what's more important is being brought in to the presence of a holy God and just sitting there and soaking in the presence of God and letting God speak to us about who we are and how far we've strayed and how far we've come. You know, many churches on Sunday morning, they pack people in at the 9 o'clock service and it lasts till 1030. 
We got 15 minutes to get them in, 15 minutes to 11, and we're going to hold them until 1230. And then get rid of that crowd and get another crowd in there. We're going to have three morning services. We're going to run thousands. But I have a question for you. Were they brought into the presence of God's holiness? Oh, come on, give him praise. I feel that. Come on. I remember one thing about Brownsville in particular. I'll never forget it. There was such a holy presence that came into that church. It wasn't Assembly God presence. I promise you it had nothing to do with me. I promise you. And I promise you it had nothing to do with Steve or Lindell. But the glory of God and the presence of God would come into that place and you'd begin to see grown men standing up and all of a sudden falling to their knees and grabbing a hold of the back of the pew and they'd start shaking like this. It reminded me of that scripture where it said, and the place was shaken. Why do you shake in the presence of God? You shake at His holiness. At His holiness. When the church ever loses sight of the holiness of God, everything else will go down the drain. Above all, keep that holiness. Keep that holiness. Cherish that holiness. Celebrate that holiness. Recognize that holiness. Never let it go. And here's what he said. He recognized just by being in the presence of God. Not God never said a word to him. God never said a word to him. It's just like so many times you think that God, boy, if he just had an opportunity to tell me something, he'd really let me have it because he don't think much of me. Is that, the really, is that really the way you think? Is that really the way you think? That is so sad. Because when God brought that prophet into his presence, a holy man, it manifested, that holy presence manifested his unclean lips. And he said, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. And you know here what else he said? He said, and I dwell among people with unclean lips. You know what Isaiah was saying? I can't help them because I can't help myself. I want to say this about the ministry. How can ministers help other people they don't even help help for themselves? How can you help them with their marriage if your marriage is on the rocks? How can you help them with their sexuality if you're in pornography? How can you help other people with things that you don't believe? Coming in this morning, I heard the Lord say to me, he said, you know, he said, when it comes to the ministry, he said, if a minister's not convinced, he'll never convince. There's something about it. Whenever your words are loaded with convincibility, you're convinced and you believe it and it's the word of God and you're anointed and you speak that out, it pierces people's hearts. But if you don't believe it, you can say it with great affectionness, but it will never pierce their heart. Why? Because if you don't believe it, they'll never believe it. Woo! And here's what he said. He said, I dwell among people with unclean lips. And what Isaiah was really realizing is by being brought into the presence of God, my ministry is so ineffectual. My ministry is so ineffective. I'm so glad I had this opportunity to have this this revelation about the holiness of God because now it showed up, of all places it showed up in my mouth, it showed up in my mouth, it showed up in my lips. I just would like to say this, if you were brought into the presence of God and you saw the Lord high and lifted up and the doors were shaken and, and you saw the holiness of God, how would your mouth stick up? How would your mouth, how, how would it shape up? Would, would your mouth be unclean lips. How do you talk? I am so amazed. Could I just be honest with you? I'm so amazed at how frivolous church people talk anymore. 
They don't say the F word, but they say everything but the F word. I'm so freaking worked up. I'm so freaking tired. Why don't you just go ahead and say the word? I had a, a pastor. Y'all, y'all can get mad at me if you want to. Hey, look, I've had people mad at me before. I'm, I'm hardened to that. Y'all ain't going to bother me. Y'all get mad at me. Just don't hit me in the back of the head when I walk up on the platform. <laughs> but here's what I'm trying to say. I had a, a, a lady contact me from the East Coast the other day. And she said that her pastor, every once in a while, tells his people, he said, I'm just going to give you some shock therapy just to see how we all stack up. And while he'll be preaching, he'll use the F word. And while he'll be preaching, he'll use GD. And, and he'll, he'll say, I just want to see if you're listening. What? And my question is, what are you still doing in that church? Because that's, that has nothing to do with shock therapy. That has to do with blatant, blasphemous sin. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's blasphemy. And the thing, and the thing that he was saying was, the thing that Isaiah was saying was, he said, I dwell among people of unclean lips. And what he was saying is, I really realize I can't help these people. I can't help somebody because I got the same problem myself. Amen? Amen. Whew. I know it's good preaching. I may take another offer in just a minute. <laughs> Isaiah said he laid that coal upon my mouth. And he said, lo, this has touched thy lips. He said, lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Oh, wait a minute. Did God say anything about Isaiah of sin? No. But when you come in contact with the holiness of God, your sin is manifest. That's why I believe a lot of times in our churches, we don't need to preach a lot of things that we preach sometimes. Just let the holiness of God come in. People will find their way to the altar. When, when God is high and lifted up, and when his train fills the temple, you don't have to give an altar call. People will flood out and they'll come to the altar. So what I'm trying to say is right now, America and the American church is in a prime condition for a powerful revelation of God's holiness all over again. When he said, I'm a man of unclean lips, an angel came over and said, I can fix that. There was no condemnation. There was no list. Isaiah, you're a good, you're a good prophet, but look here, you got a bad mouth. Never was mentioned. He mentioned it himself. And the angel come flying over, touched his lips. And as soon as the angel touched his lips, it said, he laid it upon my mouth and he said, lo, this has touched thy lips and your sin, your iniquity and your sin has been purged. And he didn't even ask for it. He just confessed it. Sometimes I think that we just get all taken up in, in semantics when it comes to praying that we just need to come before God and be honest and just say, God, touch me from head to foot. Just touch me, Lord. When I was in prayer meetings with my pastor, those midnight prayer meetings that you've heard me talk about so many times, I prayed with him every night for years without missing one night, years, every night, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the rest of the nights. There was times in my life that we would come in contact with a holy presence, that we would sit there and lay in that carpet in the dark from maybe 12 o'clock, 11.30, 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, never say a word. You didn't even want to move. You just laid in that carpet. And I can still remember the awe, and I can still remember the feeling of the holiness of God penetrating me and after it's over, when Pastor went to drive me home, out. You can't buy that with money, son. We must have those times. We must have those times. And then, let's look at Isaiah's call. 
Also, he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. Isaiah admitted his need, and then he received God's provision, and now he hears a new call to service, a brand new call to service. Isaiah couldn't be relaunched until his mouth was touched. Could I say that again? I have a feeling that many people in the ministry need to have an experience with God so they can be relaunched in ministry. It doesn't mean that God hates them. It doesn't mean that God's against them. It just means they've reached a place where they're not useful in the kingdom anymore like they once was or like God is wanting them to be used in the kingdom. And in order to be relaunched, you have to have a revelation of his holiness. Isaiah couldn't help the people that he was lived with. He said, they're people of unclean lips, and I'm also of unclean lips. And the same thing is true today. A lot of ministers can't, they need to be relaunched, but before they can be relaunched, their lips has got to be touched. Their mouth has got to be touched. They're talking too much stuff, too much junk. Too much trash. I said a while ago that a lot of times Christians start using the vernacular of the world and they're more comfortable with the vernacular of the world than they are the vernacular of the word. Are you listening to me? It sounds like that they live in front of a television set. It sounds like that they live in front of the computer. What a difference it would make if we lived in front of this and in the presence of God. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I know this may sound old-fashioned, but you know you just call it whatever you want to call it. I'm the pastor here, and if you're going to come to this church, you're going to hear it, and if you don't want to come to this church, I will find you where you are, and I'm going to preach it to you anyway. <laughs> you know, a volunteer is somebody that steps forward and says, I've got something that you need. A volunteer says, I've got the ability to do this, and if you'll just send me, I'll get it done for you. What Isaiah was saying was, I can't do anything unless you touch me. Oh, God, give us those in the ministry again that will say, God, I can't do anything unless you touch me with a fresh touch from heaven. How many of you today want a fresh touch from heaven? So let me show you this. I want to take a look at God's holiness in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 15, this is the New Living Translation. It says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders? It says, glorious in holiness. Moses who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness. When we see God's holiness, we praise him, and then he shows wonders. Let's look at it one more time. Who is like you among the gods, awesome in splendor, and then performing wonders. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this. When you see God's holiness, you'll in effect praise him, and when you praise him, he'll show you his wonders. One of the reasons we hadn't been seeing the wonders of God is because we hadn't been seeing the holiness of God. Now look at this beautiful passage in Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the hearts of the contrite ones. I want you to notice all three of these words are used twice. There's only three words used, but they're used twice. High, thus saith the high and lofty one. He said, I dwell high. I dwell in the high place. He said, whose name is holy. He said, I dwell in the holy place. And he said, I also dwell with him that is of an humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. If you want to experience the holiness of God, you can never come before him with pride. Because pride and holiness do not go together. 
Let's get it one more time. It said, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Three words, high, holy, and humble, and they all begin with H. If you want to dwell in God's presence, humble yourself. If you want to dwell in God's presence and if you want to experience His holiness, the only way, the only route that will lead you there is for you to humble yourself. Humble yourself. Let me ask this question. Have you forgotten how to humble yourself? Have you built up such a resistance to life that now you're stronger in your resistance than you are in your humility? This is in Leviticus. This is your Old Testament. But I want to show you how it sounds like the New Testament. And I'll read it to you from the New Testament. This is in Leviticus 11. This is the writings of Moses. He said, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I am the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. 19 and 2, speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. Leviticus 27, sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I the Lord, I am the Lord your God. 20 verse 26, you shall be holy unto me. I am holy and have severed you from other people. What God's saying is, I severed you and I pulled you out of other nations. I pulled you away from other people that's worldly and heathens and godless. And I pulled you away from them. And God said, I am the Lord, and I've severed you from other people that you should be mine. I want you to be mine. I don't want you to be mine in theirs. I want you to be mine. Leviticus 10 and 10. And that you may put a difference between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. And Leviticus, Leviticus, the whole book of Leviticus is a book written by Moses to help the children of Israel differentiate between what's holy and what's unholy and what's pure and what's impure, what's clean and what's unclean. And you know what? Here's the strange thing. There's so many people today that's found the Lord maybe at home or maybe they found the Lord at a meeting somewhere and they went to a meeting and they found the Lord and they got saved and now they come home. But the the church, the ministry, the ministers, the staff won't even help them to understand what's holy and what's not holy and what's pure and what's not pure and what's clean and what's unclean. They won't even touch it. And so they're left to make decisions on their own. Well, I guess this is okay. I guess it's okay for me to drink. I guess it's okay for me to do this. I guess it's okay for me to use that. I guess it's okay for me to do that. But see, you don't need a list of rules to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. But when you're brought into the presence of God, like most churches ought to offer the presence of God to the people, you know when you're in the presence of God, I don't need to go there anymore. Amen? Amen. How many of you have ever thought about this? There's some things other people that that they can do, but you can't do it. You know what I'm talking about? They can do it, but you can't do it. Why? You know that it's just not good for you to do that. And they may can do it, and they may be all right with it, but you know in my relationship with God, I I can't do that and keep the victory in my life. But nobody gave you a list of rules and said you can't do that, but it's something where you're saying, if I want to remain pure before God, I've got to eliminate this out of my life. Come on, help me, church. That's the purpose of the book of Leviticus. In Exodus, it says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's in Exodus. 
That's an exodus. God is calling out to the Jews in, in the Old Testament, I want you to be mine. I wanted you to be a holy nation to me. I've severed you from the heathen. I want you to be my people. I want to show my glory through you. But now look at 1 Peter. Look at this. Now it's in the New Testament. It says, he which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of a conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And then look at this. It says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What did, the, what did the scripture just say in verse 6 of Exodus? It said, you'll be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It said that in verse 6, a holy nation. Now look over in Peter. It says in verse 9, it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Clearly the distinction of God's people is their holiness standards and it's something that you establish and you know God's dealt with me about this listen when I go to church sometime and I hear another man preach God is dealing with me about things a lot of times when I'm preaching to you and I'm preaching to you I'm having the Holy Spirit deal with me while I'm preaching and saying I want you to stop that I want you to forsake that I want you to abandon that. And I want you to go after me. So God said, I want you, I'm not looking for a holy person. I'm looking for a holy nation. I've severed you from the heathen. I've severed you from the other ones, but I want you to be a holy nation for me. I want to show my glory among you. That's who I want you to be. I want you to be happy. I don't want you to be restricted in some kind of religious bigot. I don't want you to be some kind of a narrow-minded fundamental. I want you to be my people that love me and enjoy me. Come on. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Let me close with this. I got two important things to say to you before I close out this message on holiness. Have you ever wondered why Paul wrote epistles? You ever wondered why he wrote letters? Because in the Old Testament, when a prophet would deal with the Jews, he was dealing with people that understood the writings of Moses. He was dealing with Jews. They came up under the teachings of Moses. They had all the Pentateuchs. They had prophets. They had Daniel. They had everything complimented. It all went back to Judeo values. But now, when Paul came along and he got converts, he was called to the Gentiles. Paul was not called to the Jews, he was called to the Gentiles. The Gentiles did not have the background of Mosaic upbringing and Mosaic teachings and Aaronic priesthood. So these people were Gentiles, and they all came out of hedonism. And they all came out of the world. And so when Paul went in and preached, he was an apostle and he started churches. He wrote to the church at Colossae. He wrote to the church at Thessalonica. He wrote to the church at Corinth. Many times he wrote these epistles while in prison. And what he's doing is he knows they had no teaching. They got saved, but they had no teaching. They didn't have that doctrine of Moses. And, you know, they didn't have that influence of the Ten Commandments to see what God's standard was, and they couldn't keep it. But yet they understood the Ten Commandments. And so when Paul went out and preached and he won these people to God, there was, there was nothing. And so he had to write these epistles to give them something to help them to know what was right and what wasn't right. And so he wrote one particular passage that I just can't get out of my mind. It's so powerful. Look at what he said to the church at Thessalonica at the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
He said, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, wait a minute. He's saying something to them that they had never heard before. Because, see, they were heathens. They were Gentiles. Fornication was just normal for them. Adultery was normal for them. They had no Judeo values. They just lived like animals. So now they're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul has to help them in their walk of holiness. And so he's saying, this is the will of God. He's saying, this is the will of God. Let me help you understand the will of God. He said, even your sanctification, in other words, sanctification means to be set apart, to be made different, that you should abstain from fornication. Oh, really? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul, what'd you say? <laughs> abstain from fornication? What does that mean? You mean we can't know? Paul said, God's holy, and that's going to hurt your relationship with you being holy. And then look what he said. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification. Now, wait a minute. What does that say? That you know how to possess your vessel in sanctification. He's saying that you know how to possess your sexual drive. Mm, that's good. Paul's writing this stuff. Paul's writing this stuff to a Gentile church that had no background. And Paul said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel her vessel, in honor and sanctification. In other words, you're honoring God. And Paul's telling them, this is not good that you do this. This will, this will affect you. And then what it says in chapter 3, verse 12, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. To the end, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Look at that. That's what Paul said. Look at this now. Holiness. There's a the word. Everybody say the word with me, holiness. holiness. Look what Paul said. Now, he's, he's, he's in the same narrative, the same text. Now, he's saying in verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable. In other words, you want to get into a relationship of holiness with God where you're unblameable before God at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now. Now we're on it. So before I close, let me explain this to you. Okay. So look what he's working toward. He's saying, I want you to be holy and to think holy because the Lord's coming. Listen to me. What a mess we're in in the American church because our preachers won't even encourage people to live holy and the coming of the Lord is right at the door. And here's what he said. Even our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that he may establish your hearts unblameable. In other words, Isaiah said, touch my lips. And God touched his lips. And he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among people of unclean lips. And if you'll touch my lips, I'll show them that their lips also needs to be touched. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul was writing that to the Gentiles, he was saying, I know you don't have any teaching along these lines. And I need to let you know that God is a holy God. Back up, look at that scripture one more time. He said, unblameable in holiness before God. Before who? Before God. So here's what I want to close with today. I've saved this scripture to last. When I read this scripture, it, it slammed me. When I read this scripture, it slammed me. Because God's, God's speaking to me about some things about my ministry and about church at large and my voice into the church at large. Look at this scripture in Hebrews. It's my last scripture. It said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
I looked up that word follow. It said follow, peace with all men and holiness. I looked up the word follow and it's the word pursue. The Bible says pursue holiness. Pursue holiness. Where's the place that needs the most attention right now in my life? I'm not afraid to ask God that question, are you?